Welcome back to the second part of the lecture on taxonomy of extant amphibians. And remember this time we're focused specifically on frogs and toads. And throughout the lecture, I'm gonna be hitting uh, important morphological characteristics, the various habits and habitats they might in in encounter, uh, generalized reproduction and development patterns, general diet, and again, whether or not the animal's present or absent in Indiana and the general conservation status, along with a bunch of photos that I've taken over time. And again, I wanna uh, underscore that this is just a general lecture that I really want you to go back and review the amphibians of the frogs and toads of Indiana reference book that's required for this class. Because again, you will be asked specific questions on the information regarding the families and the individual species accounts during our in-class uh, assignments on every Friday uh, during our synchronous meetings, as well as the midterm exam, the final exam, and the homework. So make sure you keep going back to those reference books. There's a lot of really good information in there that's going to be really important as we continue through all of our lectures. I'm going to continually go back to the importance of natural history of both the species and their families and how that information is used to basically frame the rest of the conservation and ecology discussions that we're gonna have for this particular uh, semester with the herpetology portion. So at this point, I'm gonna kill my camera. So again, you can focus on looking at the slides and the information presented therein. So if you remember from our, our first lecture on extant amphibian taxonomy, we talked about salamanders and there were about 10 families in a little over 400 species of salamanders. So really not a very diverse group. But if you think about where all the amphibian diversity resides, it is with the anurans. So currently 45 recognized families, it may actually be over 50 now because they're splitting some of the families as we speak. And there's anywhere from 5,500 to 6,000 known species to exist today. So a tremendous amount of diversity with our frogs and toads. So this taxonomy is constantly changing. We are still finding new species uh, and largely that's through genetic technologies because we've got a couple of, of groups of frogs that when you look at them morphologically, they look very similar, but genetically um, they, are, they are serving as cryptic species and they're genetically distinct. Uh, so again, we're finding new species of frogs and toads every single year. So that number is, is always increasing. So in general, let's talk about some general morphological characteristics of anura, or frogs and toads. And I suspect this is a group that's probably most familiar to almost everyone in the class. It's the most widely distribu distributed group of amphibians. And as I mentioned earlier, most adults, all, all of the 5,500 species, only four species of frogs as adults retain their tails. So they generally lack tails when they're adults. And that's literally what anura means. It means without tail. And if you think about frogs versus toads, so frogs here and toads here, toads generally have very rough sort of warty skin, much shorter hind legs relative to their frog cousins. Frogs generally have very smooth skin. It's very moist, very long legs are very good leapers. So you tend to think about frogs being leapers and toads being hoppers. They have very well-developed tympana, or the, so the tympanum is the external ear. Some species of frogs, like our tree frogs, have really well-developed toe pads, which helps create suction pads so they can adhere to vertical structures like trees and limbs. Some species have cranial crests, and these cranial crests are actually really important species uh, identifiers for some of our species of toads. In terms of habits and habitat, uh, this is a very vocal group. So if you think about our salamanders, they're largely mute. Really only the sirens make small clicking noises. Otherwise, salamanders don't make any noise. Not the case with frogs. Highly, highly vocal, tremendous variation in the vocalizations that they have both within a species and across species. So they have advertisement calls, which are what males use during the breeding season. They have aggressive calls that resident males will give to approaching males courtship calls in between males and females that are in very close proximity, and then release calls uh, is when they're being attacked by a predator to try to startle that predator to get them to release. So again, a lot of variation in calls within and across species. In terms of reproduction, 
They undergo complete metamorphosis and adults lack those tails with those four exceptions. Uh, they have external fertilization in nearly all anurans, not all, but nearly all. So external fertilization is the norm, whereas internal fertilization is the norm with salamanders. So again, I want you to be thinking about the similarities and dissimilarities within these larger groups of amphibians with respect to reproduction and development. With the amount of variation and just the large numbers of species that we have, the diet is wildly variable. But in general, when they're tadpoles, they tend to be more herbivorous and eat um, vegetation. But as they transform or metamorphose into adults, they become largely carnivorous. And they'll eat essentially anything they can fit in their mouth. And we'll talk about some specific examples when we talk about the families. Geographic distribution, they range from above the Arctic Circle Yes, you heard me correct, above the Arctic Circle, and they are an amphibian, to South America, Africa, and Australia. So essentially, they occur on all continents except Antarctica. Indiana's home to 16 species of anurans. So let's go through some of these families. First family we're going to go over is the Scaphiopodidae. These are our Nearctic spadefoot toads. And I don't have a really great photo, but you can see it in the frogs and toads of Indiana, of why they're called spadefoots. They have this little circular or sickle-shaped, hardened, keratinaceous um, structure on each hind foot, which forms a spade. So they, they tend to be a transitional species where they have warty skin that resembles a toad, but not as warty, and they have smooth skin that resembles a frog, but not quite as smooth as a frog. So sort of in between frogs and toads. They also have vertical pupils, they don't have a really prominent paratoid gland like we do in the toads. But again, really that most distinctive feature is that out that keratinaceous tubercle on the outer edge of each hind foot, which is called the spade. And again, I encourage you to go back to the reference guide and there's a good picture of it in there. They inhabit tropical forest floors. Uh, they burrow real rear first into the soil where they spend most of the year. So it's oftentimes in Indiana, in be thinking about where you're finding the most sandy soils, and that's generally in the southwest part of the state, uh, from basically Evansville up to Terre Haute. Reproduction and development, they breed in very temporary ponds. And when I mean temporary ponds, this is ponds that only hold water for a couple of weeks. So by the time we get these really warm spring and, and early summer rains, the adults will migrate to these breeding ponds, They'll lay eggs in those breeding ponds. The eggs will hatch. They'll go through the entire tadpole stage and metamorphose into adults in less than two weeks. So highly, highly accelerated development. And that makes sense if you think about where they typically inhabit, which are these really sandy areas. Sandy soil usually doesn't hold, hold water for very long, so they have to have a really accelerated development rate and so that those eggs don't get exposed to arid environments. So this adaptation really helps them survive in the environments in which they're found, again, those sandy areas. They eat a variety of insects, including termites, ants, crickets, caterpillars, spiders, centipedes, millipedes, earthworms, and moss, again, highly variable. They're found throughout North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and in Indiana, we have a single species of spadefoot, which is the Eastern Spadefoot. And unfortunately, it's a species of special concern, largely because it has those restricted habitat requirements. They're just not found throughout the state. They have to have that right type of soil. That sandy soil really facilitates them burrowing and they burrow uh, feet first into the soil. So they kind of burrow backward into the soil. The next group are hylids. This is a pretty large family, about 800 species and 45 genera. So the skin is, is smooth or somewhat warty, and most of the species of tree frogs are really well camouflaged, but they oftentimes will have flash colors. If you look at this gray tree frog, you can see on the inside of the thighs is bright yellow color. Other species, it might be bright orange, and those are flash colors to help distract a predator whenever, they, whenever the frog will jump. It flashes a coloration and startles a predator, but whenever they're sitting still, those legs are tucked in, and you cannot see that flash coloration at all. Our species of tree frogs, depending on their level of arboreality, will have really large toe pads, like on this tree frog or this green tree frog, or this Cuban tree frog has really huge toe pads, and they live really high up in the tree canopies. 
compared to something like our cricket frog, which has really small toe pads, typically inhabit areas of emergent vegetation about three to four feet above the ground. So again, the, the size of the toe pads usually is some level indicator how much time they spend above the ground in trees and vegetation. With regard to uh, habitat, most are arboreal, but some are aquatic, some are even fossorial. Again, there's 850 species, so there's a lot of variation. All do return to water to breed and can be found in various habitats from savannas, woodlands to these floodplain forests. Eggs are deposited into these egg masses, these pockets uh, that can range from the size of your, your thumbnail all the way up to the size of a, a softball or volleyball. External fertilization for all 850 members of this family. Diet, small insects, spiders, so pretty carnivorous on their insectivorous, they're carnivorous insectivores. Many people think tree frogs are tropical, but they're found in North and South America, Europe, Asia, and, Aus and Australia. So we have six species representing three genera. Pretty common species. Some of the most melodic calls uh, are found in this family. Probably the group that's most familiar to everyone are our toads, and they're found in the family Bufonidae. It's about almost 500 species of, of toads. They have very thick, glandular, often warty skin. Uh, they're unique among anurans, and they have a bitters organ, which is a vestibule ovary on larval testes. They also have these really prominent paratoid glands, and you can see on this marine toad, this really large uh, paratoid gland, which secretes uh, a toxic substance so based on the species and the size of the animal can be anywhere from distasteful or an irritant to your, your mucosal linings of your eyes and your nose and your mouth, all the way to toxic to cats and dogs like it is on this, in the case for this marine toad. Most are terrestrial or fossorial, but they all do return to water to breed and they're found in almost every habitat that we have. Uh, adults and young burrow into the ground uh, to avoid freezing temperatures or really, really dry temperatures as well. They're only diurnal for a short period during the spring and fall, mostly active at night in, in hot, humid weather. So during the breeding season, males produce a really high-pitched trill where females, depending on species, can release up to 20,000 eggs in paired strings that are fertilized externally. So here you can see the male is actually amplexing the female. So here's the female. The male has his forearms wrapped around her waist so that his cloaca is matching her cloaca. She's ex excreting her eggs in two separate strings. And as the eggs are being laid, the male is depositing sperm and fertilizing, fertilizing these eggs externally. So whereas with the uh, tree frogs, I told you that the eggs tend to be in, in globular masses, uh, the size of anywhere from a golf ball, softball, all the way up to a volleyball. Toads tend to lay their eggs in paired strings. So if you see those kind of eggs in a wetland in the spring somewhere in Indiana, you know those are toad eggs and not frog eggs. The last family we want to talk about is the family Ranidae. It's about 300 species. It's a pretty diverse family in terms of its size, shape, coloration. These are generally slim-waisted frogs with really long legs, really smooth, moist skin, very prominent tympanums you can see on both of these. Um, they tend to have these dorsal lateral folds of skin, whether they go around their tympanum or go down along the sides of their back. Uh, extensive webbing on their hind feet, as you can see on this northern leopard frog. Most are principally aquatic and inhabit all types of aquatic systems, and they're mostly nocturnal. Some are fossorial and arboreal, as well as even more terrestrial forms. Um, the adult females lay eggs in a shallow pond or creek, and these eggs hatch into these tadpoles. This is a bullfrog tadpole, probably two years old, and that's my hands. You can see how large that particular tadpole is. These eggs hatch into tadpoles. The tadpoles develop into adolescent froglets, and finally these froglets develop into a, a more adult frog. And as I mentioned earlier, tadpoles tend to, tend to be herbivorous, and all tadpoles are, are herbivorous in the family Ranidae and feed mostly on algae. Juveniles and adults eat insects, um, but also if you think about things like our bullfrogs, they'll actually eat other frogs. They can eat turtles, they'll eat snakes, they'll eat birds, small mammals. Again, many frogs as adults will eat anything that they can fit in their mouth. In terms of geographic distribution, cosmopolitan distribution, 
except for South America and most of Australia. We have eight species of randids here in Indiana. So here's our, our typical northern leopard frog and, and a leopard frog egg mass, and that's about the size of a softball. So this is a family that most of you are probably familiar with. Start my video. And so, as I mentioned, really general overview of the family characteristics, and I didn't really talk about any of the species characteristics. Go back to the frogs and toads of Indiana, read those family accounts, which will be very similar to what I just gave you here today on, on the PowerPoint. But pay particular attention to those species accounts because I will continually go back to the importance of natural history to the ecology and conservation of amphibians as well as reptiles. So that's it for now with regard to the taxonomy of extant amphibians. I'm going to record the evolution of reptiles here in just a little bit, so we'll see you then.